legislation, partnership, and anti-discrimination legislation, and he has successfully litigated leading LGBT rights cases before the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, next, we'll hear from Dr. Elfriede Fritz, who is uh, a member of the Austrian Federal Equal Treatment Commission, and Dr. Fritz will speak about the Austrian Federal Equal Treatment Act, which applies to all persons employed by federal authorities here in Austria and forbids discrimination on grounds of gender, age, sexual orientation, ethnicity, religion, or uh, sexual orientation. Uh, and last but not least, we're happy also to have here today Dr. Howard Troch of the Austrian Social Democratic Parliamentary Group and the member of Justice Committee, who will also talk about the situation uh, as far as LGBT rights are concerned here in Austria, and in particular the challenges that LGBT persons face. And he'll provide valuable insight into the opinions of governing parties, the SPO, the ÖVP, and the recent deliberations in the Justice Committee. Uh, to start with, it's my pleasure to introduce um, Ambassador Daniel Baer, who is a US ambassador to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. He was previously serving as Deputy Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, where his portfolio also included LGBT rights. Uh, before joining the U.S. Department of State, Dr. Bayer was the Assistant Professor of Strategy, Economics and Public Policy at Georgetown University School of Business and a Fellow at uh, the Edmund Safra Foundation Center for Ethics at Harvard University. Please welcome uh, Ambassador Bayer.
Thank you, Tim, and, and thank you to our panelists for joining uh, today's event and to all of you for, for, for showing up. Um, it is a pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to welcome you all to America House. Uh, and I think today's event, uh, well, coming in a series of workshops, uh, is really an example of uh, the kind of conversation that is taking place in a number of places around the world, but not everywhere. And it's a really special opportunity to be able to have a frank, open conversation about current challenges in a particular country, a particular region. Um, this is the kind of thing that we wish could happen as a, as a free exchange everywhere, and it doesn't get to happen everywhere. And so in that respect, I'm grateful that we have the opportunity to have a conversation like the one um, that will follow today. I wanted to just say a few things at the outset. Uh, first of all, uh, earlier this week, I had, uh, well, the day before yesterday, I had the honor of participating at the White House uh, in the first ever White House Summit on uh, Human Rights of LGBT People. Uh, leaders from around the world, uh, from including uh, people who, who you, those of you who follow uh, LGBT human rights may know uh, the, uh, the leaders of the movement in Uganda uh, to, to push back against the law there. Uh, Matthew Shepard's mother, uh, Matthew Shepard was the victim of a hate crime in 1999 in Wyoming in the United States who, who became the inspiration for our hate crime law that protects uh, that, that adds penalties for hate crimes motivated by uh, animus uh, related to sexual orientation. Um, uh, Gene Robinson, who has broken ground in the religious community, there were uh, about 200 people uh, who, who came together to discuss current challenges in, uh, with respect to human rights for LGBT people. And the group proceeded uh, to uh, the Vice President's house, where Vice President Biden made clear once again, as Hillary Clinton had uh, Secretary of State uh, in 2011, as President Obama did when he uh, issued a presidential memorandum ordering all of us who work for foreign affairs agencies or work for agencies engaged overseas to be engaged on uh, advancing the human rights of LGBT people. But, uh, Vice President Biden uh, made, made clear again the continuation uh, of that commitment. Uh, that commitment is inspired, uh, I think, uh, by the somewhat staggering progress that we've seen in our own country. And it is progress that continues and that is incomplete. But uh, many of the speakers on Tuesday, including uh, Susan Rice, our national security advisor, acknowledged that uh, change has come faster than most of us would have predicted. Uh, it doesn't make the remaining change any less urgent. Uh, in fact, it gives us hope that the remaining change will come quickly enough, but even in the last uh, two weeks, we saw uh, first President Obama uh, announcing that there would be an executive order that would require all uh, contractors, uh, federal government contractors, to uh, implement uh, employment protections. Those of you who follow U.S. politics may know that uh, there are no employment protections at a federal level, in, in a, no legislation that protects people from discrimination with respect to employment at a federal level. There's pending legislation, but it has not been passed. Uh, however, the US government is a fairly big consumer, uh, and so the requiring that all of the contractors that we use uh, implement such protections actually has significant effects not only directly on those, uh, those people who are working in government contracts, but also knock-on effects uh, throughout uh, the economy. Uh, so we've seen that in the last two weeks, and then just yesterday, I think it was yesterday. Sorry, I landed this morning from the States, so my, uh, my head is, uh, is temporally challenged. Um, just yesterday, uh, a uh, appellate court, the level right below the Supreme Court, uh, overturned Utah's ban on, uh, on recognizing same-sex marriage. Uh, so they're the latest of, of many steps recently uh, on the uh, marriage equality front. So I think, you know, while, while our foreign policy uh, is motivated and grounded in our universal commitment to human rights, it certainly is given fuel and, uh, and energy by what we see as our own experience in, in expanding the circle of rights, uh, the application of rights within our own society uh, in tangible ways uh, through law. I think as we look at LGBT human rights uh, internationally, one of the kind of key precepts uh, that we, we undertake with respect to our policy is to take countries, uh, to, to look at countries and 
um, and to engage civil society where they are and understand the challenges where they are, because the challenges are not the same uh, in every place. They're not even the same in, in neighboring, you know, there can be stark contrast between neighboring countries, um, sometimes surprising ones. And so it really does require a case-by-case uh, a, a -case, uh, assessment and engagement with the citizen change makers, with the lawmakers, judges, uh, religious leaders, etc., in each place to understand what the challenges are and how we can best uh, support those who are advocating uh, for human rights for all. Obviously, Austria is not um, uh, on the list of the uh, greatest concern for, I think, anybody who's working in this space. But just as we acknowledge within the United States uh, that there is more work to do, uh, I think it, it is fair and good to, in places where things are better than in many other places, to say what, what work remains to be done and what work do we need to do to maintain the progress that has been made. Um, and so Austria is a, is a, uh, is a case uh, uh, in, that, in that category. I myself was struck recently uh, listening to President Fisher talk about uh, the lessons he took from Conchita. Uh, and first of all, I was struck by, I'm not sure an American president could talk about the lessons that he or she uh, had taken, even in the year 2014, from uh, a bearded drag queen winning a song contest. Um, and so, in that respect, I admire President Fisher's ability to speak both eloquently and from the heart about uh, his pride in her win and in what it meant and, and the conversations it was stimulating in Austrian society uh, and his acknowledgement there that there's more work to be done um, in Austria as well in terms of combating intolerance. Uh, and on that, in that respect, one of the things that I've been struck by in the last couple of months is talking purely anecdotally to uh, gay friends here in Austria is how many of them have said that they have felt a change in Austria since the song contest, which is, which I guess I would have been surprised by if somebody had offered that as a hypothesis uh, ex ante beforehand, um, but that they have felt that there are conversations that are happening now uh, that are supporting uh, a more tolerant, more accepting, more embracing Austrian society, and I think that's uh, I think that's remarkable and, and something to be celebrated. So I will stop there. Uh, thank you again for for uh, coming today. I hope the conversation is is a good one. Uh, part of the point of uh, this space is to allow us to engage friends and partners, uh, not only from from Austria but from other delegations uh, represented here and to have uh, a, an open exchange of views that we can all learn from each other. So thank you for participating, and thank you again for our panelists. Thank you, Ambassador. Um, just to add to Ambassador Baer's comments, uh, I received an email from, um, from an old friend, uh, Ambassador Michael Guest, who was the first uh, openly gay uh, diplomat, a professional diplomat in the American Foreign Service. Uh, he served as ambassador as ambassador to Romania, uh, 2001 to 2004. And he he mentioned that uh, perhaps in the same meeting that you were in, that the, the State Department is considering creating a new office of of a special representative, uh, worldwide representative for LGBT rights issues. So. Uh, it's, it's an, it just shows uh, how in the last year, or perhaps a bit more than a year, the, the, the questions of LGBT rights have taken precedence in, in, in a lot of work that we do on the human rights issues as well. Um, so with that in mind, I would like to open the floor for Dr. Grautner to kind of perhaps lay the ground and explain to us where we are right now on the issue of LGBT rights in Austria and perhaps in, in a broader context of EU, where does Austria fall and, and whether Austria is a leader in a lot of those things. I, I would welcome your comments here from the podium or uh, if you'd like to come here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, at the start, I'd like to get, go back quite a time, 1787. Um, 
1787, you know, Austria was a monarchy. It was quite bigger. You know. um, there was an emperor, Joseph II, and he abolished the death penalty for homosexual conduct. Up to this, 1778, uh, 1787, um, Austria applied the death penalty, burning, but not any more alive. Decapitation, afterwards, that was an improvement. And in 1787, Joseph II abolished the death penalty. Austria was the first country in the world which abolished the death penalty for homosexual relations, homosexual contact. So Austria, among those countries who ever had such a ban, of course, many Asian countries never had such a ban. So Austria was an elite. It was the first country. But it was for quite a long time. Um, he substituted the death penalty with uh, forced labor up to one month. Death penalty up to one month. But quite a few years afterwards, in 1803, the penalty was raised to incarceration of up to one year. In 1852, there was introduced a minimum sentence of half a year, serious incarceration, and the maximum penalty was uh, raised up to five years. And that was the law until 1971. Austria abolished the total ban on homosexual contacts as late as 1971. It was one of the last countries in the Western Hemisphere of Europe uh, which abolished the total ban. And even then, it did not what most other European countries did when they abolished the total ban. What uh, France did in 1792, uh, what uh, Belgium, what Netherlands, what this, uh, Italy, Spain, Portugal, all these countries, and Turkey, for instance, did in the 19th century already, abolishing the total ban and abolishing criminalization of homosexuality at all, making no special regulations in the criminal law against homosexuality, introducing same age limits, same, same offenses for public sex, etc. Austria did not do it. Austria abolished one law, one of those. And on the other hand, it introduced four new offenses. The first one was a higher age of consent of 18 years, for gay male sex. Now only for gays. The old total ban was for gays and lesbians as well. In Germany it was different since the middle of the 19th century. Only gay male relations were criminal. But in Austria up to 1979, so lesbian relations have been criminal, punishing up from one year to five years incarceration. So the second provision. Uh, so 18 years was, was the high age of consent, while 14 years was the general age limit, and the same uh, age limit was uh, applicable also to lesbian relations. So we had 14 and 18. Um, we had the criminal ban on homosexual prostitution, homosexual sex work, but again only for gay male sex work, not for lesbian. Heterosexual prostitution has been decriminalized. Remember what I have said at the beginning in 1787 by Joseph II. He was one of the greatest reformers in Austrian and maybe European history. Um, not only in these parts. And um, a third provision, especially interesting uh, today and in these days, um, if you look to Russia and other countries introducing propaganda laws, then you might be surprised that we had these laws until 1970s. 1997. So this was the third provision which has been introduced instead of the old total ban in 1971. Advertising same-sex lewdness or lewdness with animals. It was in one provision, in old tradition, in diet tradition, what was sodomy, and it was punished by up to six months of incarceration for anyone who did not advertise homosexuality in the public because that was what just uh, the headline. What was the offense? The offense was to speak positively 
about homosexuality in public. And that is much more than now in Russia, because in Russia it's on the books at least, limited to positively speaking about homosexuality in front of minors. But in Austria it was not limited to doing anything in front of minors. It was generally everything in public. If you would have said that some uh, that, uh, personalities of history have been homosexual, then you could have got uh, prosecuted. Or if you wrote it into a publication, the publication got seized. I had such a case. I wrote it much younger than now. Uh, in a publication, and the publication has been seized by the criminal courts in Vienna because I wrote that uh, famous uh, uh, personalities of Austrian history have been gay. Because that was presenting homosexuality as being something positive. The fourth provision was uh, associations promoting homosexuality, so LGBT NGOs. Um, anyone being a member of such an association, anyone who found such an association, but even anyone who advertises to become a member of such an organization, if, even if the person himself or herself is not a member of the organization, was criminally liable to six months of imprisonment. So, that was the law until 1989, when the prostitution ban has been repealed under the, uh, under the heading of uh, fighting uh, AIDS, uh, uh, the, disease of, the disease of AIDS and the spreading of AIDS. Um, then the next step was 1997, when uh, the advertisement, uh, the propaganda offense, and the, the debate on associations, um, LGBT uh, NGOs, uh, has been repeated. Um, the prostitution ban was quite clear thing almost an animus in the Austrian parliament, only four members voting against. It was more difficult for the other offenses. The uh, ban on uh, associations fell in the Austrian parliament in a free vote in 1996 um, by a two-third majority, but the Conservative Party voted against. Even the right wing party, Jörg Heiler, the EU, I remember from, the front from these days, voted for the European. Um, the propaganda law uh, fell by one vote majority, 90 against 89, because two members of the right wing party went out of the room. They had to go to the bathrooms or whatever. Um, and then we still had the discriminatory age of consent, which stayed by a vote of 91 against 91 in the free vote of 1996 in Parliament. So we had to turn to the courts, because on the political level, there was no progress. As you know, almost all time of the Second Republic in Austria, we have a coalition government of Social Democrats and the Conservative Party. And the Conservative Party, as I mentioned already, was the one who always was most opposed, um, especially it was, uh, some gas criminal offenses. Uh, so, the Conservative Party was in the government, they said no, so no, repeat. The only chance was to free vote and they failed. We went uh, to the Constitutional Court, we went to the European uh, Court of Human Rights, and in 2002, the Austrian Constitutional Court struck down this discriminatory age of consent, and since then we have an equal age of consent for anyone at 14 years, as was always with the age limit. Um, only half a year later, the European Court of Human Rights confirmed it and convicted Austria for violating the Union of, uh, European Convention on Human Rights uh, because it convicted gay men for uh, relations falling under this offense. That means men between 14 and 18 having sex with someone over 19. In one of these cases, a 17-year-old young gay man complained to the European Court of Human Rights. I have uh, represented all these cases. And uh, we won this case on the basis that he claimed that his right to sexual self-determination was violated because he could not decide himself as being a young man between 14 and 18 and wanting not only pe not, not peers, but he wanted older men. And that was, he was bare criminal from that. And would he have in 
engaged in such relations, which he wanted, he would have been called to court and witness to testify against his partners and to lay open to the court and to the public his most intimate parts of his sexual life. So also in this case, Austria was convicted and had to pay 5,000 euros for the compensation and representation fees to this young man. Um, so the criminal law was uh, then really equal as late as 2002 in Austria. And uh, we have distributed this uh, map of Europe, but the green one, you see that in, Aust in Europe now, these days, uh, there is no country anymore which has a total ban, and uh, there is no discriminatory criminal provision in Europe uh, anymore. So we have that situation which had France introduced in 1792, we have now have in the whole of Europe. But it, it afforded, it, it required uh, several revolutions. It required the French Revolution, it required uh, the Soviet Revolution, it required uh, the Development Revolution and before the Sexual Revolution. After this, all these revolutions, we finally got uh, rid of all these criminal offenses. Because these were the waves in Europe which uh, triggered decriminalization. First, the French Revolution, then, after the Soviet Revolution, the, the, the Russia, and also Denmark and, and, and uh, Switzerland, etc. Then, the Sexual Revolution, a big number of countries decriminalizing it, then, the Revolution. So, going on to other areas which we are concerned uh, these days. Um, the next in Austria was 2004 regarding anti-discrimination. Um, that was quite quick, isn't it? We waited, we've been waiting since uh, the abolishment of death penalty almost 100 years until the total ban has been removed. And then we waited another 30 years, more than 30 years, until uh, we had criminal law equality. And then, within two years, you get an anti-discrimination. Uh, but it was, not, it was not our credit. It was the European Union, because the European Union passed a directive requiring the member states, then 15, among them Austria, to introduce such an anti-discrimination law, at least in the workplace. And that what we did, exercise, uh, enforcing our obligation for the um, European Union legislation. Um, but we did not do more, at least on the federal. You know, Austria has nine states, it's a federal state. Uh, eight of these nine states, regardless how they are governed, which uh, party, right, left, they apply in their area of competence uh, the uh, ban on discrimination, prohibition of discrimination not only in the workplace, but all areas. In one state, in the Austria, and on the federal level, we still have only the protection in the workplace. Yeah. That means, so that you can imagine what it means in practice, uh, two examples. Uh, regulation of, of higher schools is, is a federal competency of, of the federation. Um, if uh, a teacher harasses, discriminates against uh, student in a high school, not a university, because university is, is, is professional training, uh, then the student cannot do anything, cannot claim for damages. It's not illegal under the equal treatment law. But on the other way around, if a student discriminates against a gay teacher, then he can claim his, uh, from the student damages and can sue him or her, because that's his workplace. So the same situation, one direction, it's prohibited, and you get damages. In the other direction, it's legal, and you don't get damages. The same regulation of uh, places like restaurants, and bars, and discotheques, that's a competency of the Federation. So again, no protection outside of the workplace. If you're visiting such a place as a gay couple, lesbian couple, and you get thrown out, you cannot do anything, it's legal because you have a caressing or because you're kissing or <coughs> just because the owner knows or, or the waiter that you are gay. So, the other way around, if you are visiting such a restaurant or a bar, you're not allowed to say, I don't want to be served by this specific waiter because he is gay or she's lesbian. That is illegal and the waiter can sue you for damages because that's discrimination on his purpose. So it's not only 
a deficit of protection. It's not only against equal rights. It's just absurd and stupid. Coming to the third part, area of concern for, for LGBs, um, traditional criminal law, protection from discrimination, and partnership relations. Um, we had to wait some more years, but not as long as we had to wait for the criminal equality. In 2010, Austria introduced a registered partnership. Um, since the repeal of the propaganda law and the ban on associations, this was the first and only time up to now when the politics did do anything for lesbian, gay, and intersexual equality. All other improvements we had to fight in the courts. And even this improvement was triggered by the courts. Because we have discussed for years and years and years and nothing was done. And then there came a summary from the European Court of Human Rights in September, October 2009. In January, we have a hearing on an application concerning the lack of legal recognition for same-sex partnerships in Austria, the case Schalke and Kofor versus Austria. And within three weeks, there was a bill, a government bill in Parliament. And after some weeks more, we had the law. And on 1st of January, it went into force. And what did Austria do in the year before the European Court of Human Rights? They waived the law. And they said, well, drop the case, we have done. Coincidence? I don't believe in coincidence. But nevertheless, it doesn't matter. We have it. It's a major improvement. But it's not equality. It's better than before. Because before, two men, two women, my partner and me, we have been strangers to each other in the eyes of the world. But now, we are something like married, but we're not married. It's registered as partnership, it's, an other, it's a different institution. Um, so we have two registered partnerships in Austria as in other countries which have registered partnership. Um, you have uh, an overview in, in this map, in this uh, colored map. Um, we distribute it. Uh, the green countries are those with a registered partnership. So the same is in Germany, Switzerland, Finland, and Ireland. Um, imagine and remember what, what civil, part, civil marriage is. Civil marriage is, Austrian law says that explicitly, is a contract between two people, men, a man and a woman, to live together in a community for life and to assist each other, each other maintain, etc. And this contract is registered in the civil status office. And then we have another partnership, which is a contract between two people, same sex, which is registered by the state as well, and which is called registered partnership. So we have two registered partnerships. One is called registered partnership, and the other one is called civil marriage. But in effect, it's nothing different. It, 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 it's nothing different. In essence, it's the same. We are not talking, uh, when we are calling for the right to marry, to marry and, and, and marriage equality, we are not talking about religious marriage, we are not talking about churches, because in Austria we have obligatory civil marriage. If you are engaging in a religious marriage by your religious community, this is a private affair, it has no legal effect whatsoever. You can get religiously married, even if you, if you uh, whether you are married by the state or not, and the other way around. Um, and uh, civil marriage must be equal. There are no impediments now anymore on race, on class, on color, etc. There should be no impediments anymore on sexual orientation and, and uh, gender, um, as we say. But we even still have, and this is the list in Germany, if you understand German, <coughs> we still have 40 differences, <coughs> so also material differences, not just the separate and not equal. We know the separate but equal doctrine of the US the Supreme Court. It's not just the question that it's separate and therefore it's also not equal because we have 40 differences in regulations between registered partnership and marriage. And uh, so it uh, really in substance it, it, it makes uh, differences. 
very, very stupid differences. I give you one example. Spouses can acquire a double name. Registered partnership, we are allowed to do the same. But the difference was, and I imagine what people these are who come on the ideas. Registered partners, partners uh, were not allowed to connect these two names with a hyphen. What <laughs> spouses con connect the, these uh, two names in Austria with hyphens. So that means the registered partners who acquired a double name were subjected to a continuum in Algic because if someone had a double name without a hyphen, it was not Spanish. That means it was homosexual. Under Austrian law, if he was an Austrian citizen and uh, living here. Um, we went to the uh, Constitution Court, that was the first case in one. Now, registered partners cannot get a half. We have even five of these things. <laughs> we have to fight for centimeters. Nothing was given to us for free. We had to fight for each centimeter of the court. Uh, the next thing was uh, that the uh, Registered partners were allowed to acquire a double name even after getting registered. Because in marriage, you could decide when you get married, or you could decide five or ten years later to acquire a double name. Registered partners could, had to decide at registration, take it or leave. That was turned down by the Constitutional Court, was the second success. The third success was ceremony. There was no vow allowed, there were no witnesses allowed. Uh, there was no ceremony allowed. The Constitution Court took it down. The fourth success, um, also very funny. The law said that you are allowed to conclude your partnership in the premises of the office, yeah? in the building of the authority, but not outside. Not in the street, not in the hotel, not in the castle, not in the palace, not on a ship. Wherever you can conclude marriages. The Constitutional Court took, uh, uh, turned it down, and now you can also register partnerships in the last hotel. Mm -hmm. The next success was before the European Court of Human Rights. Step back mm -hmm. adoption last year. We won that case. And now, since last year in Austria, we also have step mm -hmm. adoption for same sex couples, and not only registered partners, but also unregistered partners. As also, heterosexual couples can engage in separate adoption even if they are not married to each other. What is still not possible is joint adoption and successive adoption, which means that one partner adopts a child and then the other. So you can do separate adoption, but with one exception, if the partner of your child is not his biological child. Success number five, and so far the latest one for us was uh, Insemination, donor insemination for lesbian couples, medically assisted for creation. The Constitutional Court turned down the ban for medically assisted procreation for lesbian couples um, at the beginning of this year. And uh, from 1st January next year, it will be allowed for same sex couples, uh, for, for same sex couples, for lesbian couples, in the same way and the same uh, conditions as for heterosexual couples. <coughs> Means for married couples unmarried heterosexual couples, registered couples, unregistered same-sex lesbian couples. So we have to. But what we still don't, don't have is marriage. We are, and we don't have joint adoption, we still have 39, because number 40 mm -hmm. was the donor insemination, 39 differences. We are, and I'm coming to the end, I'm too long, I don't know. Um, this is a Europe rainbow map. You see from this uh, map, uh, on the left, that we have come, we have quite made an improvement over the past 20, 30 years. We have been one of the last countries which repealed the criminal law. The Soviet Union has been 10 years ahead of Austria, etc. Um, deeply Catholic countries like Portugal, uh, Spain, Italy decriminalized made it equal in the 19th century, Turkey, 1852. We did it in 1971 and finally equalized it in 2002. But now, so we were deeply at the bottom here. 
but now we are among the 15 top countries. So that's a quite an improvement. But we are still not, if you look to this partnership map again, we are still not in Western Europe. And Austria traditionally considers itself as part of Western Europe. And I think that's good. Especially as regards human rights standards, we are proud to have high human rights standards, Western European human rights standards. For instance, Austria was the fourth country in Europe which prohibited corporal punishment of <coughs> children by their parents. But as regards uh, lesbians and gays and bisexuals, we always have been quite backward. Not so much for transsexuals, but that would be too much for this uh, speech. Um, so the yellow countries have marriage equality. Since last week, you have Luxembourg added, ed, uh, yeah, uh, with only four voted votes against in Parliament. So also the Conservatives voted, voted for uh, marriage equality. Uh, conservatives in many countries have been very supportive. You know about Great Britain, David uh, Cameron. You know about uh, Reinfeldt in, in Sweden. Uh, so just in France, it was a question of right and left, but not in the other countries. And it should not become so in Austria. And so we are asking, and with that I'm concluding my presentation, for a free vote in Parliament like we had it, as you remember what I mentioned in 1996. Because we still have the situation that we have two parties in, par in, the, in the coalition government which have opposite views. One is against the Conservative Party, which uh, recently agreed to go through this list and uh, repeal maybe all of these 40 differences this we might get in autumn. But what they are still vigorously opposed is marriage equality and joint reduction of children. And to find an exit out of it, the other way would be to wait for the next elections in four or five years, would be a free voting parliament. Like in 1996, it was possible in 1996, why not today? Members of parliament are representatives of the population. They should vote according to their convictions and according to the convictions of the population they are representing. And in Austria, the population never was the problem. Don't think that Austrians, Austrians women and men, are as backward as the laws are or as politics are or parts of politics are. According to the polls, not just today, but within the past 10 years, Austria is at the top regards liberality and open-mindedness against the LGBT issues in Europe. Europe uh, polls 2006 already showed that Austria is in third place after Sweden and the Netherlands on the same level as Denmark as regards uh, uh, saying yes to uh, joint adoption of children by same-sex couples. And recent polls uh, in Austria uh, show that 56% of Austrians are favoring joint adoption and over two-thirds of Austrians are favoring marriage equality, saying, well, why don't you let them marry? They're already allowed to register. What's the difference? Um, we are not even allowed to register our partnership at the same office as marriages are concluded. We have been deported, uh, relegated to another office, the district uh, administrative authorities, not the civil status office. What are you doing there? You get your industrial license, you get your driving licenses there, you get your residence permit, and you get your control castle <coughs> there. And there you are registering your partnership, not the civil status office. So the Conservative Party wants to us uh, that we get access to the civil status office finally at least uh, in the spring next year, but uh, we, want, we want not just some equality, because you cannot get some equality. You cannot get a little bit pregnant, you cannot be a little bit dead. So we cannot be a little bit equal. We want to be equal and we want to be part of Western Europe. And so please free the vote in Austrian Parliament. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Grafner. Uh, we'll have time for questions at the end after our three presentations. Uh, as we're about to discuss the question of uh, equal treatment under the law uh, in, in public sphere especially. Um, it, it came to mind for me that uh, as little as 10 years ago, uh, for us American diplomats, 
uh, we were in a situation when our, for example, domestic pets have more rights than our partners or spouses, same-sex partners or spouses. And it's quite amazing how things have changed. Uh, I'm proud to say that uh, the Department of State has been kind of in the vanguard and the forefront of, of this change. And especially under uh, Secretary Hillary Clinton, uh, a lot was done as far as advancement of rights of partners and spouses, same-sex spouses, uh, even outside of the federal law. So she, she was able to push as much as possible within our own organization outside of the federal regulations. So on that note, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Peter Fritz to talk to us about uh, the way things are on, in the Austrian public sphere and the Austrian government. Uh, under the Federal Equal Treatment Act. Dr. Fritz. about uh, Austrian Federal Civil Service um, and the equal treatment uh, of LGBT persons uh, in our Federal Civil Service. Uh, I uh, focus on three points. Uh, first is the legal framework, uh, the second the institutions, and then how uh, we face <coughs> reality. Um, well, um, we have uh, laws um, on uh, international ground and you might know them of course uh, the universal declaration of human rights uh, convenant on civil and political rights and on economic social and cultural rights uh, we have the european convention for the protection of human rights and fundamental freedom um, and then there is the convention number 111 of the international <coughs> labor organization um, very important and dr grautner already mentioned it uh, is the European Union uh, for the advancement uh, of equal treatment law in Austria. We had no equal treatment law in the civil service, federal civil service, until we entered the European Union. So this law entered into force already in 1993 when we were in preparation of entering the European Union and we became a member of the European Union already in 1995. Uh, so the uh, European Union also changed its primary law, uh, so the uh, treaties uh, which are uh, on the constitutional level, and we have the Treaty on the European Union now, the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union, and the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, of the European Union. And in all of these instruments, um, you find uh, uh, mentioning um, of uh, non-discrimination, of course, of equal treatment, and even the sexual orientation. So Article 2 um, of the TEU um, is important because it talks about the values, the respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, non-discrimination. Uh, and then the Article 6.1 refers to the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, of the European Union um, uh, and uh, this is uh, also um, a very important instrument. Uh, the next is the Article 10 of um, uh, uh, TFEU because it says in defining and implementing its policies and activities the Union shall aim to combat discrimination based on sex, racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation. We call this article the equality mainstreaming because it goes through all these uh, <coughs> uh, breaches uh, which are important and uh, all these uh, uh, people uh, should be uh, treated um, equally and the European Union uh, should take care of it. Uh, and then there is uh, Article 91 uh, also referring to sexual um, orientation. Uh, 
the European Parliament uh, may take appropriate action to combat discrimination based on sex, racial or ethnic origin, religion or belief, disability, age or sexual orientation. So these are the uh, anti-discrimination uh, <laughs> points. Uh, then we have Article 21 um, of the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union. Any discrimination based on any grounds such as sex, race, color, ethnic or social origin, genetic features, language, religion or belief, political or any other opinion, membership of a national minority, property, birth, disability, age or sexual orientation shall be prohibited. So we have very strong law in this uh, respect. Uh, and now um, I come to the secondary legislation, which was also mentioned by uh, Mr. Gautner, the very famous Council Directive uh, 2078, uh, which uh, had to be uh, transferred into Austrian law. And this was also for the first time that sexual orientation entered uh, the Austrian law um, on, on equal treatment. Um, and. Uh, we have uh, two laws. We have one law, uh, the Equal Treatment Law for the private sector, and we have the Federal Equal Treatment Law for the civil service. So the purpose of this directive uh, is to lay down the general framework for combating discrimination on the grounds, and we again have all these uh, points like religion, belief, disability, age, or sexual orientation. And as regards employment and occupation, this is the important point. We are only in the employment sector with, uh, this, uh, with this directive. Uh, and no direct or indirect discrimination <coughs> in public or private sectors should take place um, as regards access to employment, um, the selection criteria and the recruitment condition at all levels, the vocational training uh, and the practical work experience. Uh, and um, in relation to employment and working conditions, uh, also including dismissals and pay, and also membership of and involvement in an organization of workers, of employees, uh, has to be uh, uh, allowed and should not be um, hindered. Uh, then uh, other important provisions in these directives are that there is no harassment allowed. Uh, harassment is an unwanted conduct effect of violating the dignity of a person and of creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humiliating or offensive environment for this person. Uh, you can also take positive actions to prevent or compensate for disadvantages. Uh, uh, then uh, there should be a possibility to defense uh, and defend the rights. So, so you have to establish legal entities or equality bodies. Then the burden of proof uh, uh, is uh, that the respondent has to prove there was no breach of equal treatment, which is also very important. Uh, who has the burden of the proof? And here we have uh, uh, some um, enlightenment, uh, some uh, uh, better, uh, uh, better provisions. And then the sanctions, uh, this was also mentioned by Mr. Graupner, there should be an effective payment of compensation to the victim. Um, and then you have to uh, compliant, uh, make compliant national laws. Uh, the um, uh, question was that uh, this uh, directive uh, should be implemented uh, by 2nd December 2003. So all the member states uh, have uh, to work on giving themselves their own national laws. This is the system of the European law. If you have a directive, then you have to make your own national law uh, in uh, uh, this is different from the regulation, but in this respect we only have a, a directive. So what did Austria do, this directive? Um, we incorporated it into already existing law. Uh, the politicians were discussing and then they found out, oh, fortunately we already have an equal treatment law because we had equal treatment law uh, for equal treatment for women and men. Wonderful, we have this law, so we can take these new uh, provisions and we incorporate them in the existing law and we don't have to draft a new law uh, because we also have all the institutions in the already existing law, like uh, the Equal Treatment Act for the private sector, we have the Ombud for Equal Treatment and there is also an Equal Treatment Commission which was already there, which was then uh, given another Senate, and uh, so they are now the equal bodies and they take care uh, 
of uh, the equal treatment and on the federal sector we have the federal equal treatment act for the public sector uh, and this was uh, the, the law as i mentioned already <laughs> uh, the law uh, is from the year 1993 but this law um, uh, entered into force uh, incorporating the new directive uh, almost 10 years ago uh, on the 1st of july 2004 um, sexual orientation is interpreted um, as being heterosexual, homosexual, or bisexual. This is written in the comment um, in the draft government act. So there is no mentioning of transgender and there is no mentioning of intersexual in this, uh, in this law. What does the principle of equal treatment mean uh, according to the uh, federal equal treatment act? So there should no there should uh, be no direct or indirect discrimination as regards the access to employment or occupation, the determination of pay, the voluntary social benefits, the vocational training, uh, the career promotion, other working conditions, uh, and the termination of employment. And of course, harassment is forbidden, which uh, is um, defined um, in the same way as it is in the directive. There is no unwanted, uh, an unwanted contact uh, effect of violating the dignity of a person and of creating an intimidating, hostile, degrading, humili humiliating or offensive environment uh, should uh, not exist. Um, what does it mean uh, having uh, sexual orientation and direct uh, discrimination? So. Uh, it would be a direct discrimination if candidates are asked uh, during a job interview about uh, their sexual orientation. This is forbidden. There shouldn't be any question like this. Uh, and employment uh, should not be offered on terms less favorable than for other people because they just know, oh, this uh, man is homosexual or the woman is lesbian, so uh, we give her uh, not so good uh, 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 conditions. So, the career promotion uh, uh, should not be uh, limited because of sexual orientation. And uh, then the termination of employment uh, should not take place because uh, the employer finds out, oh, this is a person uh, with a special sexual orientation and I don't want him or her to work uh, with me anymore. So this is also forbidden. Um, and um, also we have special uh, provision um, in Austrian law that you can take uh, a care holiday um, if uh, uh, your husband or your wife uh, is ill or the children are ill living with you in the same household. So you get five weeks. And this of course is also now for the partners and for that they have the same uh, the same possibilities. They should get uh, their care holiday in case a partner uh, living in the same household uh, gets ill. Um, the institutions uh, uh, I already mentioned um, are the same as we had for the equal treatment of women and men. Uh, so we have um, equal treatment commissioners in the ministry. These are uh, people um, who are uh, by decree of the minister uh, responsible to advise the minister uh, to advise the personnel about their rights under the under the law and to support them in case they want to uh, go to the um, equal treatment uh, commission. Then we have uh, an equal treatment working group. All these commissioners, they are about um, it varies between three and seven. Uh, they form the working group on equal treatment in each ministry. Then we have the interministerial working group on equal treatment uh, and this working group um, is uh, headed by the Minister of Education and Women's Affairs and it is also established in this ministry. The members of these working groups are the chairpersons of the working groups on equal treatment in each ministry, so the equal treatment commissioners. Uh, and then we have the Federal Equal Treatment uh, Commission. Uh, the Federal Equal Treatment Commission uh, is now the equal treatment body, uh, the institution which is asked for in the directive um, and uh, it is uh, also established in the Ministry of Education and Women's Affairs. 
it is no court. It is a federal administrative uh, entity in its own. Um, it can be appealed to in cases of discrimination under work contracts of the federal personnel. Uh, and the result is just an expert opinion on whether or not the equal treatment precept has been violated uh, or the advancement of women was neglected. Uh, the expert opinions um, are no court decisions. Um, if uh, uh, the uh, people go to court, then this is um, just uh, uh, seen by the judge uh, as um, another opinion. So he evaluates it uh, according to his own uh, thinking. And uh, all these opinions um, have to be published uh, Unanonymous um, on the home page um, of the Ministry of Education and Women's Affairs. So you can find they are, but they are all in German, and you find them uh, from the year 2006 uh, onwards. Um, the uh, Commission has two Senates. Uh, the Senate one um, deals with equal treatment of women and men and the advancement of women, because we have, according to our law, a 50% quota of women should be uh, at all levels, um, and uh, uh, women uh, should not face any um, discrimination. And then the Senate, too, was established according to the directive to deal with all uh, uh, the other um, uh, discriminations. And here we have, um, besides um, uh, ethnic origin, religion or belief, age, uh, also the sexual orientation. And um, there is uh, a report to Parliament um, which uh, tells all the different uh, opinions and cases uh, the uh, personnel uh, brought before the Senate. Now I come uh, to reality. We saw that we have so far good right. But uh, what is the reality? So the first, uh, it is very difficult uh, to get financial compensation. In case the discrimination was determined uh, by the Federal uh, Equal Treatment Commission, uh, Mr. Gautner already mentioned that it is so important to have it, uh, but um, it is uh, not so easy to get it. For statistical purposes, um, each civil servant is counted either as a woman or a man. There are no uh, intersexual persons. Uh, so you have to be either a woman or you have to be a man. There were 36 uh, cases published of Senate 2 since 2006. Uh, and out of these cases, only one dealt with sexual orientation. Uh, this was a man, I can say it because it is published, you can read it. Uh, he was in the police uh, and uh, in a special unit in the police and they found out that he was homosexual and they told him that they don't want him here. And he was successful in the, uh, in, in the uh, commission, of course. So. In the interministerial working group um, under the presidency of the minister, so far <coughs> sexual orientation never ever was a topic. Um, as we have to deal with uh, equal treatment um, of women and men, this is very prominent. Uh, you, we have many cases in this respect, so this is uh, um, a focus. Uh, but sexual orientation uh, so far um, was not uh, focused on. Um, and very few cases uh, come really to the equal treatment commissioners uh, in, the, in the ministries. Uh, one case um, was about uh, transgender persons, um, as um, uh, a person uh, was um, a man, then he wanted to be a woman. Uh, that uh, uh, is the more easier, but the other way around. Uh, or or uh, a man, and now he is a woman, and he says he, he doesn't undergo an operation, he stays, uh, but he is a woman. So he gets recognized as a woman, and then there were the discussions. So uh, uh, is he going to use now she? Will she use the ladies' room, or will she use the men's room? Which was rather quite a discussion. Uh, and finally, uh, uh, it was uh, settled that, uh, of course, uh, uh, the woman could use the ladies' room. 
as she was a woman. Then the next thing um, was the freedom uh, of expression. Uh, this happened, uh, Mr. Gautner already mentioned, uh, when we had the discussions of having the act uh, of uh, the partnership, uh, or there was the discussion going on uh, whether a marriage, uh, it should be marriage, uh, or it should be allowed that the people of the same sex should marry. And it happened uh, that it was not in the Ministry of Finance, I have to say, but it was uh, in the civil service uh, that uh, one morning people opened their uh, PCs uh, and they found a mail from uh, an employer uh, telling the people, oh, Today, in the newspaper, there will be a public uh, uh, opinion, a, a voting of a public opinion, whether the Austrians would support uh, the marriage of same-sex people. And I ask you, please, uh, take part in this voting and vote against, because the world should not think that the Austrians support, uh, uh, this, uh, support uh, marriage of same-sex people. And uh, the uh, uh, employers, um, uh, were uh, not amused about this and they went to the Equal Treatment Commissioner and told her, at least uh, you have to do something against this and she went uh, to the director of this unit and she told him, please, uh, you have uh, to tell uh, the, this man who sent this that he, can, he cannot do it, it is not allowed according to, uh, to our laws. And the director <coughs> said, oh, this is freedom of expression. I cannot forbid him. I mean, you cannot forbid someone uh, to think that he doesn't want it. Then we argued, we said, no, in this respect, it's on the workplace. Uh, he used the computer on the workplace. He sent the mail to all the people uh, working in this, uh, in this unit, and everyone knew that in this unit uh, were homosexual people working. So it uh, offended. Uh, these people and it's uh, in the workplace and it's a violation of the law. Then he understood. He understood and then he uh, wrote uh, to everyone that this was not correct and he does not, uh, he does not accept it uh, and uh, the next time uh, he, he hopes that this will not uh, happen again. So this is a misunderstanding uh, to defend religious or conservative values. Uh, Mr. Gautner mentioned that we are uh, uh, quite uh, uh, open-minded, that the Austrian society is uh, uh, quite open-minded. Um, yes, uh, in a way, yes, uh, but maybe uh, uh, the working personnel <laughs> in the civil service still has some uh, um, education um, or should be uh, more uh, sensitive um, on this subject um, because there is still the assumption that all workers are heterosexual uh, and so the workplace culture does not take account of people um, of another sexual orientation. Uh, um, so there are almost no outings uh, because the people are afraid of the gossip uh, and of mocking. And, um, in case they don't feel well, they find another way that they were discriminated. So they say, oh, it's because, uh, my, it's because of my age, uh, or it's uh, because uh, um, I am ill, uh, I have a burnout. So they would not uh, uh, refer to this uh, uh, sexual uh, orientation. So um, after 10 years, uh, where are we today? Well. Conchita Wust was already mentioned uh, by the ambassador. Um, I have to say that um, when this uh, contest took place, I was in Chicago and I followed on the internet <laughs> because I was very interested uh, and, and, uh, to see what's going on. And um, it was uh, really a sensation, I would say, that uh, uh, she could win uh, this, uh, this contest. Uh, and um, especially as an Austrian, and especially because she does not uh, um, uh, comply with what you say, um, what is a woman or what is a man. She has both sexes in her face, and this makes her so uh, interesting, uh, and uh, this is uh, really uh, very uh, 
very, very uh, good for the um, international uh, uh, recognition. Um, so, I think still we have to work on implementing the legal framework, uh, but we have to work on changing the mentality uh, and uh, on accepting diversity. And um, yes, and the rights of LGBT persons uh, still need to be advanced. Uh, and of course, the enforcement of these rights. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fritz. Um, I would like to, to perhaps challenge our last speaker to kind of summarize the first two presentations in a way uh, Dr. Brautner referred to uh, the historical overview and then kind of took us through the history of Austria from Habsburg Empire to the present, uh, noting that Austria today is uh, right behind Sweden and the Netherlands and the liberal attitudes of its population. And, and Dr. Fritz then uh, gave us uh, an overview of all the legal advances and where we stand on the legal grounds. So uh, what perhaps, what stops Austria from following examples of Luxembourg and France and Portugal in, in, in this fight for marriage equality and uh, being sort of an example in, in Central Europe and, and perhaps even in the German-speaking uh, region? Uh, with that in mind, perhaps we can look into the current Austrian politics and see where things stand uh, in relation to various political factions and parties in the Austrian government, Austrian parliament. So I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Harald Krog from the Austrian Social Democratic Parliamentary Group to kind of give us uh, a summary of everything that was set up to now. <laughs> I actually would like to start with a question. I would like to ask you um, a question about an expression that made history, an expression that made history um, in the United States and even before. And this expression is the pursuit of happiness. I'm sure you have come across this expression, the pursuit of happiness. Now, the pursuit of happiness is this a private issue? Is this a personal issue? Um, or in how far is the pursuit of happiness a public, of public interest? Is it a political issue? And the exact expression actually, uh, which is historical, is life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. We can find it for the first time in this context in the American Declaration of Independence drafted by Thomas Jefferson. Now, Thomas Jefferson calls these two, these three elements, among others, about truth that are sacred and undeniable. And he speaks in this context of unalienable rights. I repeat, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, what are barriers? What are barriers today in life to liberty and the pursuit of happiness? It is discrimination, on the one hand, and it is the inequality before the law, among others, but today dealing uh, with the gay, lesbian, bisexual, and uh, transgender community, I concentrate on these two issues of discrimination and inequality before the law. So we see there is already quite a long historic approach and context uh, beginning here with Thomas Jefferson, who builds his idea about the American Declaration of Independence, of course, on European ideas, the European period of enlightenment, European philosophy. Um, speaking about changing our society, changing the world, means we have to deal with the question how politics is made. Um, and politics uh, and policy are not only made by a political elite, not only by laws, 
not only by the debate among the political class, but there is a public opinion which is created by many more factors than a political elite. Now, I'm giving you two names which are important for Austria, but not only for Austria. The first one is Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton is a regular guest in Vienna, uh, not in the parliament, not uh, at the seat of the chancellor, but Bill Clinton is a regular guest at the Life Ball in Vienna, a um, big social, cultural, political manifestation, artistic manifestation, musical manifestation once a year, um, where um, a very um, effective team raises funds in the struggle against AIDS. Very effectively, and Bill Clinton comes here because he supports these funds, and he also contributes, the name Clinton already has been mentioned here today, um, Bill Clinton contributes in this struggle against discrimination. And uh, the second name, Conchita Wurst. Conchita Wurst also has been mentioned here already today. And uh, the thing is that it's not only the Austrian, after, after almost 50 years, an Austrian success at this Eurovision Song Contest, but she says, my song is a political statement. My song is a political statement against discrimination and she adds, we are unstoppable, which is also a political, a clear political <coughs> statement and a political aim. We are unstoppable. Now, as I said, making politics is not only making laws. It's much more than that. Because making laws in a democracy Making laws in a democracy mean, means you have to have the support of the public opinion. So what is the public opinion? What is the public opinion in Austria? Of course, like in any democracy and also in a dictatorship, the media play an essential part. The opinion leaders and the opinion leaders specifically in the fields of sports, the arts and music, the economy. And then there are social forces. And I give one example for a social force. Uh, these are the, reli the religions and the churches. The religions and the churches. And now Austria, and I was asked now what is the political situation? What are the political forces in Austria that are a barrier or a guarantee for a progress in these issues we are discussing today? Now, still, uh, and I hope it remains so, a force, is the Catholic Church in this country. I'm not Catholic myself, but I recognize the Catholic Church as a very important cultural, more than religious, also a cultural and social factor in this country. And I must say that with the new Pope, Franciscus, some new ideas and dynamics also have reached Austria. Franciscus himself, also when he speaks about the gay issue, he says, our age should be an age without discrimination. He rejects discrimination. Of course, he has another background. He has another approach to these issues. And speaking of Austria, as a still, in quite some fields, Catholic countries, the Catholic Church is a factor in our country. Um, now, let me just give a, a brief report on uh, yesterday's meeting of the Justice Committee of the National Council. The National Council in Austria is not the government, but it is the main chamber, um, the main house of the parliament, uh, the Nationalrat in German. And yesterday's meeting of the uh, Justice Committee um, had 12 issues, and six of these 12 issues dealt with gay issues, gay lesbian issues. And um, there were moves uh, about the civil marriage for gays, the gay marriage. Um, that means 
um, a modern marriage law. Um, and uh, in this context, uh, I would like to point out that the valid legal definition, the valid legal definition of marriage is from the year 1811 in our legal uh, codex. Um, and since then, since these 200 years, quite something has changed in society. Uh, I think you would agree with my thesis. Um, now, it's not the task of the state to, to tell every individual how he has to create his private relationships and his marriage, but a modern state should create frameworks for solutions. Frameworks for solutions in every social field, of course. And regarding that more than half of the marriages get divorced, but on the other hand, a certain percentage of the people are excluded from the legal marriage, uh, this means that there has to be, um, there has, that needs to be some new approach to the question of marriage. Um, so in this, we, yesterday's meeting, we have adjourned uh, this, these two uh, points of the agenda these two issues we have adjourned because at the moment there are talks between the Social Democratic Party and the ÖVP, the Austrian People's Party, that means the Social Democrats or the Socialists and uh, the Conservative Party. Um, why there are talks? Now, the SPO has talked with the ÖVP for decades on various social issues, also in the gay field, but now obviously some movement has arrived in society and in politics. Now, why is there a movement? Why is there a certain readiness to discuss the question of equal rights in, uh, within the gay and lesbian um, issue? And I'm back again at the names, synonyms. Synonyms, Clinton and Conchita Wurst, because they stand for social, cultural issues and the public opinion the public opinion, and that means when the vice chancellor from the ÖVP says um, the ÖVP will rethink some of their positions <coughs> in the gay and lesbian um, issue, it means something. And when the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister of Agriculture who uh, gave an oath when he got into office as a minister and said, he, um, he swears at, uh, at the, how did you call it, at the chalice of the holy blood of Jesus. It means uh, people think, would think he's a very, he has a very hardline conservative position getting into office and giving an oath on the holy chalice of the, of, of the holy blood of Jesus. And when this minister now says he is for the free adoption of children by, by gays, by gay couples or also gay individuals, that means something for the Conservative Party. So there is, is as a matter of fact, there's really something in movement. And this Conservative Party, the ÖVP, has to watch out that is in social uh, sexual issues not overtaken or outnumbered by the Pope, who has, I would say, on some issues more progressive positions than the Austrian Conservatives. Now, a second issue that was discussed was adoption. Adoption um, of children by, by gay people, by gay or lesbian people. Um, it was already reported, also um, Dr. Grafton reported about um, the position of the European Court for Human Rights and the appeal of the lesbian couple, which was a bit big progress and we see so social progress is not only made by public opinion but also by political elite and I'm speaking of the judges of course as part of the political establishment and the political elite of course. Another issue was the compensation and rehabilitation um, uh, of victims of the severe anti-gay laws in the past. Uh, victims of uh, persecution and discrimination. Um, another issue was um, 
uh, amendments on the civil partnership, uh, the joint family name, um, and uh, as a barrier, as one of the barriers I was speaking about. Now, the position of the Social Democratic Party has been clear for decades, actually. Uh, that means the civil marriage for gay people is, for us, um, a natural demand and a natural cause. And it's really time to realize the civil marriage for gay people, uh, for gay and lesbian people and, and uh, uh, um, transgender and bisexual people um, um, in, in Austria. And, um, the and the same it is with adoption. The same it is with adoption, of course. Now, I can, um, I can imagine very effectively that we might come to a position to propose a free uh, voting in Parliament, a secret but free voting. Um, the whips of the parties, the whips of the uh, party factions, of course, are not happy about that because if this comes in fashion, uh, the free vote in Parliament, uh, for the party clubs, so there might be crumbling in other issues too. But I think in this, uh, with this issue, it can be argued, and it would be actually a help for the Conservative Party, for the ÖVP, to get out uh, of this difficult situation which this party finds itself in, being uh, or, or there is force on the ha one hand of um, social fundamentalists, also parts of the church, of the Catholic Church. But we must not imagine that the whole Catholic Church in Austria is one monolith of, of reactionary ideas. It is not the case. There are many, many progressive Christian and Catholic people who already live in their daily lives, who live in their families, a very modern form of family life, with or without gays, whatever. Um, and on the one hand, there is a new party, the NEOS, which put pressure on the Republican because it's, a, um, it's an economically liberal party in quite some issues, conservative party, particularly with its economic program, privatization and all these issues which are typical for this direction. Uh, but the NEOS are modernist, I would say, on quite a number of social issues, social issues. Not, I'm not speaking about social policy, but social in the sense of issues which matters in society, such as equality, equality with gay lesbian rights, for instance. Uh, so the Earth of Base in this predicament of various forces which uh, use pressure on this party. So I think the idea of a free vote, a free secret vote in the National or in the National Council. Uh, could be um, a strategy. And I'm sure there is a majority, as well as for the adoption of children by gay people, as, um, uh, as for the civil marriage for gay people. Now, I'm not speaking just about gay marriage, I'm speaking about the civil marriage. I'm not interfering in any Catholic or in any Christian or Muslim community how they deal with the question of marriage of gay people. I'm speaking about the state and the state laws. And the state always has to be above the religions, above certain social organizations. The state has to be in function for all citizens and can't be an instrument of one religious group or one uh, church. Now, just to give an example for the barriers which still work in Austria. Now, when Conchito Wurst had won the Eurovision Song Contest, which was a bit surprise to many of us Austrians, it was a surprise to me, but a happy surprise, I must admit. And then the first congratulations came. Of course, our president, um, Heinz Fischer, didn't have any problem in congratulating Conchita Wurst heartily, neither had the chancellor. But um, some politicians did have a problem. So the leader of the Conservative Party did not congratulate Conchita Wurst, but he con congratulated Tom Neuwirth to the success. Now, not all Austrians knew that this is the name of Conchita Wurst. The 
the so to say civil name, the born name, uh, but the leader of the Conservative Party just could not take the word Conchita Wurst in his mouth because he has another social concept of masculinity and femininity, a very fundamentalist conservative concept of male and female. So we see this is a political problem, which we see in his using a name and avoiding another name, because it touches conservative concepts of male and female. Um, finally, just a few words, and then um, I'm, I'm finished about uh, gay communities in, in general. And, um, well, we can, we can deal with a gay, lesbian, transgender, bisexual questions either from the aspect of equality, of a society without discrimination, human rights, or the Austrians very often like the approach of a pragmatic view of things. That's also why I'm very sorry to say this here in this house, but also Austria keeps up contact with Russia in these days. And economically, we really need that, I would say. But uh, speaking about pragmatism in politics, I would say there is also a pragmatic position towards gay and lesbian communities. And that is, uh, and within the gay and lesbian community, there are many, many creative, very well educated, well trained, politically conscious, very engaged people in their professions. Now this sounds like a prejudice, and maybe it is also a prejudice, but on the other hand, it has also some truth. Now any modern country, any modern metropolis city, which would not try to bind these people to its city, to its country, they would lose. They would lose a great potential artistically, economically, socially, humanely. Now, it is, in, for politics, it is a demand, it is a demand, actually, to attract also, not only, but also among all other social groups, to attract the gay and lesbian community to its, um, to its society and make the country also a home country to this social group of people. This also from a pragmatic point of view of developing the country, the city, economically, artistically, and socially. Now, I would like to thank you very, very much for your attention, for your vivid interest. And my particular thanks goes uh, to the General Consulate and uh, the Ambassador and the team of the consulate, the embassy, and the America House for making uh, this afternoon uh, possible, making possible that we discuss these issues here today. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'd like to open the floor for questions. We have time for a number of questions for our panelists. If I could ask you to introduce yourself as you ask the question, please. Yes, yes. No, no, he doesn't have, or he or she, no one is forced to go through the Equal Treatment Commissioner to the Equal Treatment Commissioner. It's just... Uh, and, and which would be more effective, do you think? Hmm. I, I think if you go to the Equal Treatment Commissioner, then uh, we try uh, to find a way, a uh, sort of, of uh, talking to both sides, uh, not, uh, not uh, having it uh, in a... On, on a field uh, with, uh, with uh, confrontation, uh, but find a way uh, to accept uh, this uh, person who, who feels or who thinks or who, whom, who is discriminated, and then uh, to talk to the other side, to the directors, to the 
leading personnel um, to open their eyes and to tell them, look, what you are doing here uh, is not okay, and isn't there any way we could remedy this situation? And um, in many times we are successful by this way. This is maybe also because there are not so many uh, uh, not so many cases um, in in front of the uh, of the Equal Treatment Commission. But if someone is not uh, 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 satisfied, I mean the Equal Treatment Commission. I always say um, is also sort of a psychohygienic. Uh, um, instrument. Uh, people go there and they talk there and they can tell everything uh, and then the commission also looks into it uh, or the com and talks to the people and asks the other side and then uh, find, uh, find uh, even the, the op uh, give, give the opinion. Uh, uh, I mean when we are in the Equal Treatment Commission then we are almost, uh, we had before, before we go to the Equal Treatment Commission we tried to remedy the situation in the in the unit or in the ministry. If this was not successful, then we go to the Equal Treatment Commission. And then if there is no success, then of course the people could go on to the Court of Justice or they just leave this behind and say, oh, I don't, I don't. I mean, I also met people, they say, oh, I don't go. Uh, I, I will not ask you for your opinion because I know you cannot help me. I just directly go or I also know these kind of people, yes. Thank you. Quick question for Dr. Gautner and Dr. Stroll. Uh, the difficulty, perhaps, of balancing the, the pragmatism that Dr. Trope referred to uh, with, with our responsibility uh, to fight for equal human rights, uh, and, and of course, the visit of President Putin comes to mind uh, that happened yesterday. Uh, Dr. Gautner referred to uh, to a number of uh, laws uh, in Russia today that refer to propaganda and, of course, the situation that uh, gay and transgender citizens of Russia face kind of between closet and the jail cell. Uh, where do we, I mean, for, for us as diplomats, of course, it's, it's a question that uh, we deal with uh, all the time. Uh, where do you think the international community and Austria specifically should side here with uh, a matter of pragmatism on one side and our responsibilities for human rights on the other? Uh, well, we in the LGBT community are not as pragmatic, we are fundamentalists because we are convinced that human rights should be Except, uh, respected, and uh, we are not happy with this visit. We protested against it, we marched against it, and uh, we do not understand how Austrian politicians can invite such a statesman and such a president of such a country in times like these to Austria. Who would be next? King Jong Un? <laughs> Well, I think there is no alternative to dialogue. Now, there is fortunately no Cold War anymore in Europe. But in the times of Cold War, the Iron Curtain was 60 kilometers from here. Austria was a crazy country. And Vienna was a crazy country that received the, the politicians from dictatorships here also, not only the Western democracy. Now, I think the situation in Russia has improved. I'm of different opinions to Dr. Grautner. I know Russia very well. I've been to Russia many times, and I've been to the Soviet Union, and I can say the development in Russia is positive compared to 30, 40, 50 years ago, also in, the, in regard to gay and lesbian legislation. And even then, in the times of the Cold War, dialogue was the most important group. And when our politicians, our travelers, just simple travelers, went to Russia, when other people said, no, boycott Russia, we did go there, but we also talked to victims of the dictatorship and gave them courage. Gave them courage to continue their lives and their struggle. And I think, it is important when we talk to Putin, and he is a factor, he's not a nobody. 
And we're interested in peaceful solutions, also in the Ukraine, in peaceful solutions. And they only get peaceful solutions by talking, not by not talking. This is an experience of the Cold War, of the Cold War time. We should never forget. So when Putin was here, and this was politically discussed before, also in Parliament, I was in our political clubs, that Fischer, as well as Feynman, the president and the chancellor, will give their opinion also on sensitive issues, like the gay and lesbian issue, like the freedom uh, of speech or the freedom of the press. And in this sense, Austria just continues a position we had in the Cold War, that we say yes to the dialogue and yes uh, to speaking about issues and we say no politically, we say no to the non-dialogue. May I answer? Of course. I'm also favoring the dialogue and talking to each other and it's always important. You should never stop, stop talking to each other. But the question is if Austria really needed to do it on itself and why not does the European Union uh, as a whole uh, talk to Russia and to Putin and I think they, they are doing it regularly. Because there is no European line. Um, then you should work on that. Um, but uh, I think that's the strategy of, of uh, Russian politics and Putin to, 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 to divide the European Union, to divide the Western world. And uh, now that's what they said. When, when Putin came back, well, now we have Austria on our side, who is the next? Mm -hmm. So, uh, I don't want to be a dead uh, I don't want to be on, on the side of a regime who just uh, took out a part of another country, of another independent country, and just uh, annexed it. Uh, it's not just about what happens in Russia, it's, it's, it's about uh, going to another <coughs> country and just taking out a part of another country and to uh, include it into uh, one's own country. And then you are inviting this uh, uh, president of this country, uh, and even if you are doing it, it's not necessary that our president, I'm, I'm, I'm highly esteeming him, Mr. Fischer, our president, for what he has done for the LGBT community, but that does not change the thing that he did yesterday. Uh, it does not mean when, when uh, he invites Putin and he receives him here, it's not necessary that he, uh, he and and then the others are receiving him with standing ovations or getting abused if Putin speaks of good dictatorship. That's not funny anymore. Please. I would say, uh, Jan Kirsch from the embassy, I would say that of course dialogue is important and it should go on, but it's the timing of it that was so unfortunate about this particular visit. Of course there should be dialogue, but not maybe within months of a breakup of a, or attempt to break up of a, another European country and the annexation, illegal annexation of the Crimea. The timing was just very unfortunate. And it seems to be repeated with some of the things that happened in the past. For example, I know the first Austrian gas deal was signed just months after the Soviet Union invited, invaded Czechoslovakia. So uh, they really should have been a little bit more wary of the timing of, of these deals with the Russians. I mean, you deal with them, of course, uh, but uh, you really have to do it now. I, I agree that the timing of the visit is unfortunate. Uh, I disagree when you said, Dr. Grafner, and then Putin was invited. Putin was invited a year ago. The, the, the visit was fixed a year ago, not after the occupation uh, of, uh, of the Crimean Peninsula. This was, fixed long, this was fixed long ago, um, and I agree, I think it is a bit unfortunate, yeah, I agree. Um, but on the other hand, uh, now Austria, Austria dares to say, with a very low voice, we say, yes, we do have a little bit economic interest. There are other very, very big countries. They follow the, uh, the foreign policy according to the, according to the economic interests. I'm not giving any names which countries that are, uh, that base the foreign policy very clear on the economic interests. Now, if Austria dares to say one time we do have little bit economic interests, 
then this is a bad thing. And this is dishonest, I think. I know honesty is maybe the most abused word in politics. I think it is. But I dare say that Austria has a little big economic interest. And I think it's not unjust that also this little country, Austria, with 8 million inhabitants, which had, is in a very difficult situation now with, with two, three bank crises, which are here. We're in an extreme difficult situation to finance, to overcome these crises financially, economically. And if in that situation, we may say we do have little economic interests, and now, once we act according to our economic interests, I think this is not completely unjust. I think it is not. So, so is it about peace and to keep in dialogue, or, it, or is it about money? No, it's not money, it's about jobs. It's that people have work. If people that might earn less than you or than me, if these people have, have, have let's say, maybe 1,000 euros a month and work in one of these factories, like in my district, my constituency is Levens district in Austria, and at least we have three industrial complexes where the people work also um, on products that are exported to Russia, uh, and the people fear about their jobs. Um, this, I, by economic interest, this is not money. Economic interest is also that people have a job, have work, and have an income for themselves and the family. Any further questions? I think probably there is proof to both uh, arguments here. It's not actually an argument, a discussion. Uh, and and these are the, the choices uh, that we sometimes face, and uh, choices perhaps that. Uh, uh, both of the sides uh, have some truth to them, and maybe you know, it's false to us as diplomats sometimes to, to, to uh, make the right choices and make the right decisions. And, uh, any, any other questions? Any in the best place? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm Rita Meyer from, of, uh, I come from the Embassy of Canada. I will thank you for the very interesting all, all, intre uh, all three uh, presentations. And I have an, more or less an uh, administrative bureaucratic question to you also, to the organizers. Is it possible to, would it be possible to get uh, uh, electronic versions of the very enlightening presentations, but they were so rich of uh, historical data, of, of kind of uh, organizational data that I wasn't quick enough to copy it all. If, if, if it is at all possible to share those, that would be greatly welcomed. Well, from an organizational point of view, I know we are videotaping the whole discussion. We'll probably have it available on our embassy's website. Ah, that's, that's and we can share it also. Thank uh, you so much indeed. Thank you so well. much. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, please. So, um, Alex Janelia from the UN office at Vienna. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Fritz. Just to um, understand a little better the, um, the anti-discrimination policy. In, the example you gave uh, where the employer uh, sent an email telling people to go and vote. So, so that... No, it was not the employee. It was, yeah, some an, yeah, an employee. A civil servant sent in. No, ah, no. Okay. It, wasn't the, it, it wasn't the director, but it was just a civil servant working in this unit and he sent the email. Ah, okay. It was it his was private opinion. And then the director said, it is private opinion, it's freedom of expression, so I mean, I cannot um, hinder him to express a private opinion. Ah, okay. And um, our argument was that uh, the private opinion, that the border of the private opinion right. is exactly there where you discriminate right. on the working place. And this was, according to our view, it was discrimination on the working place because it took place at the working place. Ah, uh, so no, this, is, this is what I'm trying to understand, the, the, where the boundary is. So mm -hmm. if the employee had said this rather than... Yeah, he, could, he can say it. I mean, he can discuss it. He can discuss it, I mean, uh, in, in, the, in, in the Mensa or, I don't know, talking privately. He, mm -hmm. he can discuss it, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah? But he, he used, he used his, his official uh, uh, PC, his, his official uh, term, uh, terminal, and he sent the emails to, to, the, to the email addresses, not to private, but to the uh, uh, official email addresses uh, of all the people working in this unit. Uh, 
So it's the act of emailing. Exactly, it's the act. It's it's the act of emailing, and then knowing that there are people, there are homosexuals working in this unit, so that they could uh, uh, could be offended by. Uh, such an act saying, I am against the marriage, so I am against homosexuals. So they can say, why is he here? I mean, this is a sort of an interpretation. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, no, thank you. Thank you. I'm interested in, I'm, I'm Edward Harvey from the India Embassy in the Council section. And I'm interested in the, the idea of, this, of the discussion itself. And it seems to me if we take what we've heard today, um, and we learn that the Austrian people are really quite open to the idea of LGBT rights, um, and then when you have laws that have been implemented, but you have laws that haven't been implemented, uh, can each of you tell us, maybe very briefly, the one thing you think needs to be done to start that discussion in politics, or in the in the public, in the workplace, or in the courts, in order to push the, the next step right? Well, I think the discussion has already started. And now, again, we speak about how, how politics is made, actually, how it works, how politics works, how we change things. And when a political elite just sees politics as their own business, it will not work. This is a phenomenon we partly see in the European Union. For me, many ideas of the political elite of the European Union does not reach the people. And by people, I mean really the rank and file, the also less educated people. People uh, which understand or grasp politics rather emotionally and not intellectually. So how can politics, how can the idea of a political change reach the people which are less educated, which are not used to an intellectual or political approach, political scientific approach to politics. Now I think a very efficient method is that politics goes into alliance with sports, entertainment, arts, music. Why? Because these are emotional fields. Sports, um, entertainment, music, the arts reach people uh, rather on an emotional level. Not only, but also more on an emotional level than politics. And um, I think the chances of creating a more intensive alliance in, in gay and lesbian issues with the arts but also with sports. I just think of more and more coming out of sportsmen or sportswomen <laughs> about them being gay. This is a progress in Germany as well as in Austria. Now, going into more alliance in promoting these issues with sport, entertainment, music, the arts, can be an efficient axis to approach and to get movement into this topic. Just the political elite uh, itself discusses it will help us only very limited. Uh, okay. Sure. Yes, yeah. Uh, I think uh, we really need open discussions. That uh, understanding uh, and uh, support uh, the uh, homosexuals, the lesbians, uh, uh, support these people uh, to out themselves that uh, we can talk about it uh, freely without, uh, as I said, without mocking uh, and um, accepting, uh, mentally accepting uh, uh, their uh, way of, of, of life, their, their status, so that it's also a normal status and it's not, uh, it's not something uh, uh, special uh, which is not recognized and uh, uh, it, it was already mentioned that of course we are a more conservative country, uh, we are, uh, um, we, we have a very strong Catholic, Roman Catholic uh, community um, and in this uh, thinking uh, uh, the, the, the homosexuals um, have not, uh, I would say, maybe not a real place yet, but of course not uh, not the status of, 
of being no, no that this is the normal life. This is always something something special, and uh, and you talk about you say yeah yeah you know he or she is yes yes we know but still we don't talk about it and we better forget it and 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 you, you know the whispering in the in the back and and this is I think we need an open a really more open society on this and and more more understanding and uh, maybe it's still what I think it's maybe in our societies our uh, our past. Basically, I agree with what the other panelists said. Um, there is still a lot, of, lot to do. Also, the uh, survey by the Fundamental Rights Agency of the European Union showed that there is a lot of discrimination still going on, not just in Austria, all of Europe and the European Union. Um, but nevertheless, um, as I've mentioned, the uh, Austrian population is quite open-minded. Um, you cannot compare today's life of uh, LGBTs with uh, back 20, 30 years, or even longer. Um, it has improved. I also agree that Russia has, it has improved. I never said that it's as terrible as in the Soviet Union, of course. Yeah. Um, but, uh, and we, will, we, 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 we still have a lot to do. Yeah? Um, for the time being, it would be enough if politics would come to terms with open-mindedness and liberalism, which is already there in population. So, we have to start with uh, what we have achieved for, for women, for instance, mm -hmm. yeah. 50 years ago that the state itself, that the laws, the regulations, are not discriminating anymore. That is not the end, because it doesn't mean that you don't have discrimination in society anymore. Yeah. If you are e equalizing uh, the legal position so that the state itself stops discriminating, does not mean that in society and, and the population stops discriminating, but it's a starting point that you can effectively improve the situation. Um, but we, for, for FGP, we don't have that, e even that we don't have already. Uh, even the state itself still discriminates. And uh, what's the most absurd thing is that even in its equal treatment legislation, in its anti discrimination legislation, it discriminates because it has a hierarchy among discrimination grounds on race, ethnic origin, disability, you have the highest level of protection and uh, then comes gender, and then comes sexual orientation, and age, and religion. Um, so even if the state in its own equal treatment uh, uh, legislation discriminates, um, you won't get far with uh, improving the situation in the population. Uh, but we are already far. And uh, the politics have to, have to solve the situation in Parliament, so that they are really a representation of the population. At, at the moment, they are not, because in the population we have a vast majority for equal treatment, at least in the law. So that the population says, why should the law discriminate? Why should the law uh, be different? So we are looking for uh, ways, exit strategies, and one exit strategy is the free vote in, in, in Parliament to, to break up this, this uh, blockade situation, and I'm very happy to. Here today, that uh, Dr. Talk, who is a member of the Parliament, who is a member of the Justice Committee, uh, today supported, fully supported our call for a free vote. We have uh, visited uh, the day before yesterday. We have uh, visit Putin visited Vienna. We, we visited the <laughs> Austrian Minister of Health, uh, and he is from the Social Democratic Party, and he fully supported the free vote. We have made it public today. Um, we have visited on the same day the Minister of Interior. She's from the Conservative Party. She, she did not support the free vote, but she did not oppose it. And that's even an improvement. She said, okay, maybe we can do that. It's up to the Conservative fraction in Parliament. Now we have to go to the Conservative fraction in Parliament. So that's what we are do having been doing for the last 30, 40 years. Um, it's very hard. It's very time consuming. It's very 
energy consuming, but uh, we had major successes and I'm convinced that in the end we answered it. Thank you. Uh, on behalf of uh, Ambassador Wesner, who would be here today and for whom uh, the issues uh, facing the LGBT community are very important, unfortunately she is in Salzburg today, but I'd like to uh, express uh, our gratitude to our speakers for taking time uh, to be with us today. Uh, your willingness to share your expertise with the diplomatic community at this forum is a testament to the strengths of Austria's relationship with its international and civil society partners and, uh, and its concern for the issues facing LGBT community. Thank you. Um, I'd like to end with a quote uh, from uh, a, a aforementioned ambassador guest, uh, who, uh, Michael Guest, who referred to Secretary Kerry uh, in a speech where he spoke mostly about the current attitude of Russian, Uganda, Nigeria, and some other governments uh, to LGBT issues, but it really applies to uh, most of the governments around the world, even the ones in, in, in the democratic societies. Uh, and he said, we need the governments to understand that they cannot scapegoat LGBT citizens to distract from their own shortcomings. We need them and their publics to understand that while religious beliefs are to be respected, it cannot supplant the government's obligation to provide each citizen with equal protections under the law. We need these governments to understand that every individual, empowered or not, is entitled to basic human rights. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming to us.